In this issue of Fashion Classics, we examine the fine art of French fashion. First, two designers who showcase their fall 2004 collections at, appropriately enough, the École des Beaux-Arts. I didn't want to have a, a, a huge show. I have couture for that. I just wanted to provide women, girls, uh, an everyday way of wearing the car. Is the hair and makeup choice good? Uh, is the story going to really be believable on the catwalk years and now? Breaking down the barriers between fashion and art, Victor and Rolf. Victor and Rolf was heavenly. I loved the whole mood of the show, the sort of um, deer in headlights uh, look of the model. We take an exclusive look through the archives and new museum of Yves Saint Laurent. It's not an art, but fashion needs an artist to, be, to exist, to be created. But for some designers, fashion is art, regardless of the venue. John's always a showman and uh, wonderfully inventive in his collections. And more fashion classics next. Many designers show in Paris in the École des Beaux-Arts, but it's Dries Van Noten's artisanal pieces that seem most at home in the famous art school. French printmaking students worked unaware as the designer ran through the studios to do final checks. The hardest part of my job are uh, most of the things I like, uh, but what, things that I don't like so much, in fact, is just like the two hours before the fashion show. Then I really would like that it's just over. Really? Yeah, really. It's, it's, really it's really like tough. Is the hair and makeup choice good? Uh, is the story going to really be believable on the catwalk years and now? This season, he need not have worried, as Van Noten's story translated clearly onto the runway. The story what we want to tell this season, it's like women about in the 1920s, 1930s, interested in driving, uh, flying airplanes, of traveling, so going to Venice, going to Constantinople, going to China, Japan, and things like that. So we're really bringing from there like pieces to mix with their own wardrobe. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a little bit like the idea behind the collection. A lot of fluid fabrics, uh, length often, also like a mixture of prints, a lot of georgettes. So kind of drapey way, also like beading and glass work, glass beading and then uh, fake diamond things. And all these elements are really like 1920s for me. The glitzy makeup, done in the company of classic frescoes, foreshadowed the spectacular finale, while the hair played more to the designs on the runway. It's kind of like very, very 20s looking hair, but it's kind of like really quite rough and raw and very, very romantic very very soft. What we kind of wanted to do with the hair was to do something that looked like it had come from that time but it had actually been destroyed and lived and maybe hadn't been done. For me it was a kind of nice period because it was really that women really started to be real people in, in, in the in the world, because before that it was really like it was more like sexual liberation. It was really they really started to be part of the world, and, and you had to be to take count of them. You really had to look at them. And also, it was a very nice period because people could be still be surprised. People still could discover things. Not like now, where everything is really like you just go on the computer and everything is there. So. Uh, but for that, it, for me, it's kind of maybe a little bit nostalgia. I travel, of course, but not so much. I, mostly I travel in my mind. China, for me, is one of the countries which I really would like to go to as soon as possible because I think it's changing there very fast for the moment, so it would be good to go as soon as possible to see what, what it was. Also showing in the beautiful École des Beaux-Arts was Christian Lacroix. While Dries Van Noten took the dark and sexy disco route, Lacroix played the venue as an understated airy, befitting his folksy gypsies. The starting point is uh, gypsies, all these um, patrock people, people um, traveling from the States. To, this is uh, one of the main inspirations from the house. I'm born south of France where we are. A big, big, but so important 
pilgrimage for gypsies. When I was a child, I was surrounded by these caravans and all these women mixing flowers with stripes with polka dots in the 50s and being very sensual. And uh, 50 years later, we, I think we are all a little bit gypsies, really, and mixing everything. <laughs> smoky, transparent, like a bit, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit like being in a circus, but in a very delicate way, transparent, like colors on the eyes, shade, all mixed together. You don't know where the color is finishing, but at the end, it's not carnival either. It's very childish, very fresh. It's very, like, very optimistic. I'm doing Lacroix. <laughs> all these uh, specific chignons from Lacroix who exist since a long time. I think it was the first chignon who was done uh, for his haute couture years ago. We tried to uh, prove or to tell or to show that every kind of ladies or women or little girls um, might be Lacroix clad. But this season, it wasn't just the ladies he was dressing. Lacroix also showed menswear on the runway for the first time. Red, orange, salmon, and a uh, certain knitwear and embroideries on, on the shirt, but it's not obvious. Not too feminine and not too uh, mannish. Quite a casual for Lacroix collection. It's not a, a red carpet target, and the focus is much more on day wear, cocktail wear, than on um, evening wear. I didn't want to have a, a, a huge show. I have couture for that. I just wanted to provide women, girls, uh, an everyday way of wearing the car. There was one thing that got the attention of the fashion press at the Victor and Rolf show this season. When it first started and I saw the antlers, I thought, oh heavens, you know, where are we going here with this? But I think they were using that to kind of illustrate sort of woman as warrior, but as a gentle warrior. The Dutch duo were looking to create a fashion fairy tale, albeit one that began with a series of temptingly beautiful coats. I think at the beginning of the show, there were so many coats that I mean, it was almost like a tease. You kept wondering, well, what's underneath that? It had a lot of sort of the Victor and Rolf signatures, the oversized collars, and that sense of androgyny, that kind of mix of male and female. And I thought it had also the sort of double collars and tricks with the waistbands and things like that that they've sort of become known for. I thought the evening was a little bit difficult. Um, I think that their great strength is really in their tailoring. And the evening really tried to be very soft and fluid and focused a lot on draping. And I sort of feel like they still have a little bit of a ways to go with that. I thought sometimes they used fabrics that were so thick and so full of texture that it, it, it just sort of fought with the whole uh, concept of draping. I love the crystal and I love, you know, their little signatures of, you know, the crystal spiders and the crystal flowers. I thought that was terrific. Oh, it's sort of just enough creepiness to keep it interesting. Victor and Rob was heavenly. I loved the whole mood of the show, the sort of um, deer in headlights. Uh, look of the models, but the beginning of the show was just pure elegance. Those guys know how to cut a beautiful suit, a beautiful coat, and it manages to look both modern and timeless at the same time.
When Yves Saint Laurent announced that he was retiring from his Haute Couture house in 2002, many wondered what would become of his immense archive. The answer came this season when Saint Laurent and his longtime business partner opened the Pierre Berger Yves Saint Laurent Foundation. The museum will house the 5,000 haute couture garments and 15,000 accessories and sketches that the celebrated designer created over his 40-year career. Long time ago, the first time when we decide to preserve some uh, clothes and we decide to create a foundation to preserve um, Yves Saint Laurent's work and to offer contemporary artists a large space. The museum is not mired in the past. In order to bring it up to scratch, the building underwent a vast refurbishment. Now all artifacts are stored in correct museum environments with preset humidity, temperature, and acid levels. Gowns and accessories are upstairs in huge compactors, while sketches and photographs are stored in the basement. We call it the Bible because it has it's really at the beginning, you have all the original sketches with the name of the model, with the number, and then really the description of the, of the dress. So it's possible really with all these uh, pieces to really recreate each dresses we have. To create the art space, Berger converted what was once the Couture Salon. It is. Uh, about art, and the title is Yves Saint Laurent Dialogue with Art, the relation between a couturier and artist, the relation between fashion and art. And the first relation uh, with Saint Laurent, between Saint Laurent and an artist, was Mondrian in 65. After Mondrian, Saint Laurent went on to create work inspired by Matisse, Van Gogh, Braque, Picasso, and of course, some of his most iconic work was inspired by the pop artists of the 60s. Not an art, but fashion needs an artist to, be, to exist, to be created. He did so many, many things for women, because as you know, uh, Chanel gave uh, freedom to women. And uh, many years after, Saint Laurent empowered women. That's, uh, for me, it is a uh, the greatest achievement of Sarah. Having recently launched his most casual CNC line, fall 2004 was time for designer Ennio Capasa to rethink his original costume national line. It also gave the designer a chance to tell us where the unusual name actually came from. When I was very, very young, you know, I started my business. And at that time, you know, I was, um, I was thinking maybe it's interesting to don't use my name to be more mysterious. And my brother just uh, presented me a beautiful book from an antique shop, which, called, uh, which the name was uh, Le Costume National, it's a French book from two centuries ago, all handmade, beautiful. And I found, you know, wow, that's fantastic, and it just became my name. <laughs> This is my, if you want, dream, my interpretation of one, uh, 1001 Nights. It's um, try to keep the color, the emotion of the Orientalism, bring into the couture in the, into our city. I always mix this time the black with color. This is a uh, Persian blue, then we have uh, Rubin, red, and we have uh, green, a lot of color mixed with, with, uh, with black. Uh, we have a bright red, 
uh, we have turquoise. So there is this kind of um, gold, silver. So we have a lot of um, classic reference of color bring in the, in the modern different way. Today, you know, you have to, to look at uh, the buttons, for example, like here, you have the trench coat of, uh, you know, of uh, this um, fur, which have this kind of details. I work a lot, of course, in, uh, in the silk satin, which is very important this season, uh, in, uh, in cashmere wool for the coats, uh, chiffon, of course, georgette, some print. Uh, I try to use a very, very sophisticated and uh, couture fabric. I try to work in decoration and evening night especially in the elegant part with a lot a lot of details. So there is this kind of, um, if you want, uh, uh, luxurious point of view of night. When I was a child, I mean, it's like something that you, when you read, you have a lot of imagination, you know, you can dream as you want. And I think today, today is very, very important as a designer to try to bring hope and creativity in our world. So I thought that, uh, you know, that kind of spirit gave me the possibility to be free. Under the gilded chandelier of the Grand Hotel in Paris, Hussein Shalayan showed a collection that many considered a retail dream, even if the premise was slightly more esoteric. The whole idea started from um, the clothes being like sort of capsules uh, that can create the sense of solitude almost. Uh, that's the idea that you contained within the clothes. Um, that's how it started off. Based on identity really. And it was um, beginning with the primary self, then the national self, then the global self. So uh, in the beginning you'll see clothes that are um, sort of quite intimate in a way. And then it goes into uh, things that, are ha that have like um, a sense of volume around the body, but also have references that have kind of slightly ethnic references, but it also feels quite contemporary. I was looking at all the reforms in the early 20s. Um, of the dress code, how religious attire was abandoned and how um, women could vote and uh, the alphabet had changed, etc. And I looked at Atatürk, the, um, uh, the figure that created the Republic. Uh, so it was, it's the print and the embroidery is based on this whole idea of um, old posters, really, of that era. And then that final idea was, uh, in a way, things that you uh, rely on, things that are um, inbuilt. Um, so there are actually garments with CD pockets and stuff and um, iPod pockets, the idea that you can actually contain yourself and then garments that are actually quite intimate. But it started off from the idea of like how I feel in today's world, basically, you know, there's, there's quite a sort of solitary existence. Essentially, I'm very interested in the whole idea of cultural identity and how, I guess, how we, are for, how we form in some ways. So I want to look at this idea of the definition of the self, really, and how you define the self in this day and age. And I think it's very much to do with solitude, actually. That's why I call it the anthropology of solitude, because I really think that more and more the world kind of um, evolves. I think that the more um, alone we are, in a way. You know, the silhouettes are quite different. Uh, there's a lot more volume in the trousers, and um, there is um, a lot of volume on the skirts. I've, evolved the language over the years and you know you just do your own thing and you kind of try to push yourself in your own way and um, and sometimes certain things are in the air and you you pick up on it or you don't but I pretty much have tried to evolve in my own way and uh, and I can look at some of my old stuff you know right from the beginning I can still see parallels you know so um, but generally generally speaking I think that it's good I feel kind of happy about doing something new each time because I feel like I progress. Crinolins, corsets, and Coca-Cola cans dominated John Galliano's runway this season. Surprisingly, the designer drew on the Yemen tribes of the Middle East for inspiration. The hair and makeup teams took this as a starting point and added their own extreme twist. Today we're doing, um, it's a mixture of, uh, inspired by the people of Yemen, 
um, 19th century Edwardian hairdos, and then bag ladies. We're mixing that all in one head, which means we have little braided bits, we have little curls, we have flowers, we have vine, we have fur, we have ropes of hair, we have saran wrap. There's a lot of things in the hairdo today. We are doing, um, with the, the, influenced by the face painting of the people of the Yemen. So we have, you know, a lot of black lines going on the face with dots, orange cheeks. We're playing between pale skin and dark skin. And then we're also doing Edwardian doll-like makeup, really fragile young girls. So um, we're having a lot of fun. What a show, it was just a swashbuckling, amazing romp through history. Lots of seafaring um, inferences and references, but incredibly creative. Well, I thought the crinolines were as sort of high, wide and handsome as a Spanish galleon, and I mean, they absolutely went down the catwalk like that. I love the corsetry. Because I think, you know, if you stripped away those huge skirts, which obviously were a lot designed just for the catwalk, you were left with a fantastic Edwardian sort of Victorian silhouette. Very, very wasted, very tight, very tiny on top. What a show. You know, great spectacle, but beyond a spectacle, what a great statement about contemporary life. The metaphor about it was really important as the world gets more homogenized. Those clothes, they were also about people in charge of their own destiny, pushing those skirts, you know, pushing your life through there. And just a great John Galliano show. He's a great showman, but there's real subjects underneath all that. And so it goes beyond. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important that John continues to let his imagination run free this way and not worry about well, you know, how many actual articles to wear and all that, because they're there in the stores. John's always a showman and uh, wonderfully inventive in his collections, but I, I actually thought this one was not only inventive and fun, there were underneath all the crinolines, there were a lot of really pretty and romantic dresses and ideas, wonderful ideas with furs and jackets. So, I mean, I think once everybody goes back and deconstruct it. Not only was it you know, a wonderful lift for all of us to see, there's lots of fabulous clothes there um, for people to buy.